Appendicitis is one of the most common surgical emergencies and you absolutely need to know how to recognize and manage it. In this tutorial, I'm gonna cover all the clinical aspects of appendicitis and also try and give you some useful nuggets of information that you might not get out of a textbook. So let's give it a go. Nobody's really sure why we have an appendix or what it actually does, but suffice to say, it is of varying lengths, usually just a few millimeters wide when not inflamed, and it can lie in varying positions. For example, the appendix can be pelvic, it can also be retrocecal, so that it lies behind the cecum, it can be preileal, lying in front of the terminal ileum, the appendix can be retroileal, lying behind the terminal ileum, and the appendix can also be paracolic, so that it lies adjacent to the cecum and ascending colon in the right paracolic gutter. Why does the appendix sometimes become inflamed? In most cases, no cause is found, but occasional causes include a faecalith, which is a stone made of poo that can potentially obstruct the appendiceal lumen, leading to appendiceal dilatation and also vascular compromise. Another important cause is Crohn's disease, also tumour, for example, carcinoid or neuroendocrine tumour of the appendix, or adenocarcinoma of the cecum. How does appendicitis present? Well, patients will suffer abdominal pain, and the typical history, and remember it's not always typical, is a patient who describes periumbilical pain that then localises to the right iliac fossa. Then they often, but not always, get vomiting often with anorexia, and there may also be a fever. So abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, fever, and anorexia. Patients may have a slight alteration in the bowels that gives a hint that it may be related to the colon, and often it is just an episode of perhaps some loose stools. Don't forget to ask the patient about any urinary symptoms, and take a gynecological history, as you need to also consider the differential diagnoses, which we'll come on to. Ah, oh, Johnny's back, he's not well again, doesn't look too good. Well, we need to examine him, so we need to expose him from nipples to knees. Oh, that's a bit too much, but I just wanted to show you that patients with appendicitis sometimes lie with their right hip flexed, as it's much more comfortable for them. If they were to straighten it, then the psoas muscle may irritate anything inflamed that's overlying it. Now, patients with appendicitis can vary between looking very well with having normal vital signs, or they could be quite unwell, showing signs of sepsis, such as being warm, peripherally dilated, tachycardic, and febrile. Now, when we examine Johnny's abdomen, what we need to do is imagine a line drawn from the right anterior superior iliac spine to the umbilicus, and a third of the way along that line is McBurney's point. Now, we should expect, in most cases, to find patients tender over McBurney's point. Now, how do we distinguish clinically between abdominal tenderness and pelvic tenderness? For example, in a young female with pelvic inflammatory disease, well, we may get a clue by the position of the tenderness in the right iliac fossa. So just like a pelvic mass that we can't get below when we examine it, if we can't get below an area of tenderness, then that may suggest that inflammation and the origin of tenderness is coming from the pelvis. So don't forget to look for signs of peritonism, so that would include guarding, percussion tenderness, and or rebound tenderness. Now on occasion, you may be able to palpate an appendix mass, which is essentially a ball of inflammatory omentum, appendix, maybe cecum, and a bit of terminal ileum too. Now there are lots of eponymous signs when it comes to appendicitis, but let's just talk about two of them, as I don't think you really need to know very much about the others. So a positive Rovsing sign is when the patient experiences pain in the right iliac fossa when you palpate the left iliac fossa. Now psoas sign may be elicited. If we were to ask Johnny to lie on his left hand side and then passively extend his right hip, if he was to experience pain in the right side of the abdomen, then that would be a positive psoas sign. Now that's due again to irritating anything inflamed lying over the right psoas muscle. Now don't forget to perform digital rectal examinations on your adult patients, as for example you may elicit some tenderness there, that would add to your clinical picture. So as we've just alluded to, the young female with right iliac fossa pain is so common. Often a gynaecologist will ask you to exclude appendicitis, which you just can't do until you're actually looking at the appendix. But similarly, pelvic inflammatory disease is also a diagnosis that is sometimes made at laparoscopy. 
So differentials of pain in the right ileate fossa in females include pelvic inflammatory disease and acute ovarian accidents such as ruptured or torted ovarian cysts, hemorrhagic cyst and ovarian torsion, a real emergency. Then there's the potentially rapidly fatal ectopic pregnancy. So don't forget to look at the urinary beta HCG. Now gastroenteritis, colitis, UTI and renal colic are all important and realistic differential diagnoses. Okay, you've done the clerking, you've written the history and examination in the notes, now it's the investigations. And as you may have gathered by now from the other tutorials, think of the big six. Six essentially bedside tests you need to at least consider for every surgical patient. So first up, look at the capillary blood glucose, as this can be raised in sepsis, particularly in diabetic patients. And diabetic patients who are vomiting may not be absorbing any antihyperglycemic medications, which may also see their blood glucose shooting up. An ECG may be useful, for example, as a baseline or in patients who may be going to theatre as part of the preoperative assessment. Look at the urinary beta HCG in female patients and use the urine dip to investigate differential diagnoses such as renal colic or urinary tract infection. A patient is unlikely to be suffering from appendicitis if both their white cell count and CRP are normal. Have a look at the liver function test and amylase in order to investigate other differentials. A coagulation screen and a group and save should also be considered. Also consider arterial or venous blood gas. And finally, an erect chest radiograph to look for free air under the diaphragm and an abdominal film to investigate other possible causes of abdominal pain or vomiting, such as bowel obstruction or renal colic. What further tests do these patients sometimes need? Well, in a male, you'll often find there is not much else to explain a patient's problem. So a male patient with a right eye like foster pain with a reasonably straightforward story and some raised inflammatory markers might go straight to theatre to have his appendix locked out. Now, an ultrasound scan is sometimes useful, but you'll find that most of the time the appendix isn't visualised. And even if it is, then the diagnostic accuracy may not quite be up to scratch. In females, however, there are some gynaecological causes of pain that may be found in ultrasound that may obviate the requirement for surgery. But in practice, ultrasound scans arguably delay things long enough for the patient to get better or for their appendicitis to get a little bit worse and declare itself. The next step is either CT with a high accuracy or diagnostic laparoscopy, which can obviously be therapeutic too. Appendicitis needs treating. Now medically, we can give antibiotics. In practice, antibiotics are given if the patient is septic or once we have committed to an appendicectomy as it may just mask things enough to cause some diagnostic confusion and uncertainty about whether to take the patient to theatre. Now, antibiotics can resolve appendicitis in some cases, but it may well come back, it may not work, and it is simply not the gold standard of treatment at the moment. Now, on the other hand, if there is an appendix mass, then it may actually be safer to let things settle with antibiotics so that when the interval appendicectomy is performed a bit later, it's a bit easier technically, it's all a little less inflamed and friable with consequently less operative risk. So the gold standard of management is appendicectomy. Should we perform laparoscopic or open appendicectomy? There are a few small details on this slide that I don't think you need to know for your exams, but will make you feel a lot more comfortable understanding management decisions on the ward. On the whole, if we take laparoscopic appendicectomy first, the key advantage over open appendicectomy is the ability to have a look at the other organs. So particularly in females, of course, laparoscopy is a useful diagnostic tool for the instances when the appendix looks normal. On the whole, it is thought that laparoscopic appendicectomy results in a quicker recovery and less pain on the first operative date. But for some reason, there is a higher risk of abscess formation. On the other hand, open appendicectomy may be slightly quicker, but this will be operator dependent, so perhaps better for patients who are really sick and need a quick appendicectomy, particularly males, where you don't have to worry about possibly needing to have a look at the pelvic organs. There is a slightly smaller risk of bleeding and urinary tract infection, but a higher risk of wound infection compared to laparoscopy. In practice, the key considerations are whether the patient is male or female, whether the surgeon is happy and competent to perform a laparoscopic operation, and, of course, patient choice. Now, all this was a summary of results of a meta-analysis, so a very high level of evidence, and that can be found at the link below if you fancy some extra reading. Left untreated, patients can die from appendicitis. 
Like Harry Houdini, who escaped from a lot of things, but unfortunately not from the perforated appendix that would have led to sepsis, shock, multi-organ failure, and death aged just 52. Nowadays, dying from appendicitis is rare, but complications may involve intra-abdominal abscesses, leaks, and intracutaneous fistulae. Well, that's all you need to know about this common condition, appendicitis. It affects young people with right eye lap fossa pain that has often migrated from the umbilical region and can sometimes be associated with nausea, vomiting, anorexia, fever, and bowel disturbance. Examination may reveal tenderness over McBurney's point, and there are some eponymous signs too. And look for any peritonism. Then do some tests. Consider the big six and then perhaps an ultrasound scan, a CT, and think about laparoscopy or open appendicectomy. Remember, appendicitis can only really be excluded or definitively diagnosed by actually physically looking at the appendix. Now, many people seem afraid of appendicitis, but in general, it's easily treated. Thanks for watching. Bye bye.